Hey, everybody. Uh, good to be here. As you know, the topic of today, we're going to be talking a little bit about comp plans and how, was, how to structure those and how to make them um, like really good for your company in different times. Um, I think, uh, Savannah, we had uh, two different um, polls that we wanted to run. I'd like to start with those uh, because I want to be able to collect some information on correct on how people are getting incentivized and this is to just SDRs only are you getting comped on meeting set held pipeline created or revenue generated what's the main driver of your commissions I'm going to give people a minute to uh to answer that um and this is going to be fun I I do have a set agenda to for us to cover we're going to be talking first about SDR comp then we're going to use some of those principles to also understand how simple we can make AE comp. But I want to get especially new leaders that might be here or sales ops teams that have questions about comp or even if you're an SCR and AE and you're wondering, is your comp fair? Uh, we can talk about some of those. Um, cool. And I think we can close those polls. That's easy. And we can just uh, throw the second one there. Let's see some of the results. Interesting. So the majority, 42%, voted on meetings completed. A few people are getting highly incentivized, even at the SDR level, to be on revenue generated. Uh, some people on pipeline created. Cool. Outside of revenue generated, what are other incentives? Uh, if it's none, you can click on other. Uh, and if there's too many others, I'm going to ask people to put it in the chat just to understand if there's actually others or none. I realize we didn't have that as an option. Cool. I think we can close that one. Pretty simple questions. And let's see what we have. Multi-year contracts. Cool. Some people getting incentivized on that. Payment timelines, very few, only 6%. Self-source leads, 28% get higher incentives as an AE on self-source leads. I like that. And then on the other, there's also about 30% saying other or none. So cool. Um, here's what I want to start with. I want to kind of like give everybody uh, like my mindset as a sales leader on how to incentivize my team and how to make everybody happy. Um, and both incentivize uh, or create the right incentives for both the like individuals who are part of the comp plan, but also for the company, right? So like a lot of big companies do their comp plans and they, and they do them wrong because they have too many things that like create traditional problems. One of the problems in like big companies is like, for example, base salaries are too big and they start paying, let's say commissions on, on every meeting when you're an SDR and every deal closed when you're an AE. And what that creates is like, if I'm going to use just random numbers and I'm going to try to make it easy, but imagine your OT is 200K and your base salary is like 100K if you're, a, if you're an AE, right? If you close 30% of your quota, you still get to 130. Well, if somebody closes like 100% of the quota, they, hit, they get to 200. When you look at the revenue generated for the company, the rep who got to full quota sold three times as much as a rep as the rep who got to 30%. Yet at the same time, the rep who got their full quota cost you 200K and the guy who generated only 30% of the quota cost you 130. So what ends up happening is for one, the low performing reps are costing you a lot of money. They're not generating a lot and perhaps they're making enough money not to incentivize them to leave. So. I do not like home plans where you kind of incentivize uh, the mediocre uh, reps to stay. I really, when you're, a, when you're a rep, I want you to either hustle and succeed or weed yourself out because it's just not working for you. The other thing that I also think is I really want my top reps to be making a lot of money. So you're going to see that in the ways that I design these home plans, if you are a top performer and you're top of the leaderboard, you're going to be making a lot of money. It doesn't feel like if the top rep is like at a quota or above quota, they're really not making like to make two, three, four times as much as somebody else. It's almost impossible, right? At quota, you're at 200K. How much do you need to get to like 300K to make 50% more money? 
well, you probably need to like almost double your quota if there's no accelerators. And when there's accelerators, you might need to get to 170, 180% just to make 150% of your um of your pay. And the reason for that is that the base salary takes takes a good chunk of uh or compromises a good chunk of your pay. So what you're gonna hear me do both on the SDR side and on the AE side is a little bit change the structure so that if you're a top performer, you're actually making a really uh, a really big amount. Final thing that I'll say is all these comp plans, I try to make them as easy as possible. There's too many companies, especially when you get big. There's a bunch of accelerators, a bunch of de decelerators, like micro incentives, like little things that they put here and there. And like really as a sales rep, I don't care if you're paying me 1% more for this type of lead or 2% more for this other type of lead. Like you shouldn't be using a hundred different variables. If people don't understand their comp plan, they don't know how to work it. So with those principles, I want to start a little bit with like how SDRs traditionally get paid. I can also share some stats that I get to read and see and hear from the industry. So like companies like the Bridge Group, um, which is a, a very well-known kind of like consulting company in the SDR space, puts together some reports on, you know, average compensation levels. And what you're seeing nowadays is like, we're going to start the first 20 minutes of this webinar purely on SDRs and feel free to throw questions in the Q&A or put it in the chat. I'm going to try to check those. But what, do you, what you're seeing right now in the market is average base salaries for SDRs are maybe 50 to 55K. And then their average OT is like 75 to like 85K. Those might have moved a little bit over the past six months given inflation or whatever else, but that's where most companies are at. Now, when you look at how most SDRs get compensated, you obviously have um, different variables you can use. You have your base salary. You have meetings set, you have meetings held, you have meetings getting to a certain stage, or even meetings getting to close one. Before I get to the exact structure, let me tell you why I like some of these variables and I hate others. I do not like the idea of a business paying commissions on meetings set. The main reason for that is unless the meeting happens with an account executive, the business hasn't realized any value from that. And what that encourages is for the SDRs to create a lot of meetings that are like what I call is a slammed meeting. There really wasn't any value being explained to the prospect. It was just like very high level and we're just shooting calendar invites left and right. That's a really bad idea. Meetings held sounds like a really, really, really good one. And what I got to clarify is when I'm designing these comp plans, I use systems, call it something like lean data, or I split my team, call it uh my CSMs are going to act as inbound SDRs or whatever else. But what I do is anybody who's a hand raiser, any demo requests, contact us forms, um, or like anybody that's coming through, let's say a drift or a chat functionality, that does not go to an SDR and the SDR does not get paid on that. That goes directly to AEs or it goes to a CSM or to somebody who's just uh, uh, scheduling meetings and qualifying in or out for inbound requests. So everything we're going to talk about is outbound. Uh, meeting set, bad idea. Meetings held, I love it, especially because those hand raisers are not coming to you, so you never get like free commission. And then I really don't like, across the board, utilizing stages. Trying to incent incentivize SDRs to, to like have meetings that move to stage two or three or four, we don't really control where the prospects are in their journey. Like, I really want my SDRs to go hit the right target account or the right buyer persona, but like, if the AE has the skill to get that person to the next level, that's a little bit more on the AE. So I'm not going to use anything stages. When it comes to closed one, I tend not to like it, but there's a little exception. And the exception is if you are working with SDRs that have more control over who to reach out to, and they have really like an open floor uh, of, of leads in that regard. So if you think about that, if I'm an SDR and I can go get up a meeting with South Florida Pancakes, and that's going to be a 5K deal for my company, or I can go reach out to IBM and close a 700K deal, I really don't want those two meetings to be worth the same. They're clearly not worth the same when it comes to revenue. So like, I would incentivize it. So across the board, the way I'm going to think about it is enterprise mid-market SMB, slightly maybe different comp plans but most of the comp, most of the variable should be on meetings held. If you're gonna add revenue, I would, I would not add revenue on enterprise and I would probably not add revenue on mid-market deals. And the reason for that is the sales cycles are too long. It's really hard for an SDR to go get a, get a meeting 
uh, get maybe some commission for that. But then the sales cycle is 12 months. By the time I get my commission based on the revenue of the meeting, it could literally be a year plus. And the other reason why that really hurts you as an SDR team is most SDRs are not going to be in the role for five years. And if you're really going to be in the role for like 12 months, there's going to be the majority of your meetings by the time you get promoted, change roles, do something else. And that deal closes, you're now working in another department with a different comp plan, with a different idea. So compensating on revenue for enterprise or mid-market deals is really, really hard. I am okay when companies add that as a variable on the SMB. So really like if your sales cycles are like two weeks or four weeks or something really quick, and these are like 10K, 15, 20K average deal size, that's actually a huge difference. Like closing a 20K deal versus a 10K deal is twice as much, right? When you're in the enterprise, usually all your deals are like in a more similar ballpark. Like they're not multiples of one another, right? A 5K versus a 20K is four times as much. So like I would incentivize maybe on my SMB reps to do a little bit of revenue uh, as part of their comp plan. Cool. I've given you all um, a little bit of background and context on how I like to structure these uh, calls, uh, uh, these incentive plans, and then how I like to compensate for different variables. And we've talked about a little bit of like enterprise, mid-market, SMB. I want to get a few questions. You can submit it in the Q&A if there are questions about this idea. And if there are any differences between how I am thinking about these comp plans and yourselves. Um, Savannah, I'm not sure if you are reading anything on the chat. I'm seeing a few things come through. Um, any questions that we have so far? Okay. Paying commissions on meetings held or only on those that advance to the next stage. I recommend highly uh, aligning to meetings held. Now, here's what I want to talk about. I'm actually going to give you a very specific examples of how we're going to compensate um, an SDR when it comes to their specific comp plan. One thing that I was talking about right at the beginning is that I don't love when the complaints are perfectly linear. So imagine I'm an SDR. For simplicity purposes, we're going to call my plan a 50, 70, 50K base, 70K OTE. Cool. Even if I get zero meetings, I get 50K. And then or we're going to call it a 50, 74, just so that it's uh, a little bit easier. It's $2,000 per month uh, on the incentive. Uh, but if I show up and I do nothing, I still get 50K. And then if I like get to my quota, I'm going to get another $2,000 a month. Imagine my quota is six meetings held per month. Well, that would mean if you actually run the math, $2,000 per month is your um, variable. You need six meetings. That gives you an exact $333 per meeting. Okay. Now, there's two ways to really design this comp plan. I could go and say to my SDRs, cool, here's your comp. It's 50K base. $333 per meeting. If you get six meetings, you're a quota, it's 2K. If you get three meetings, you get 1K. If you get nine meetings, you get 3K a month. Okay, but think about like the business value. Like if you actually look at like how valuable it is to have an SDR that gets you nine meetings versus how valuable it is an SDR that gets three meetings, that SDR is literally a 3X the value. Well, when you look at their comp, they're only getting a $3,000 commission check versus a $1,000 commission check. Sure, that is 3x the value. But when you start factoring their base salary, call it that's $4,000 a month, that'd be 48 of the 50, but you get a point. Your top rep is making 7K a month. And the guy that's like barely doing anything and only getting three meetings a month is getting 5K a month. Somebody's producing three times as much why wouldn't you pay them closer to three times more? The low-performing reps making 5K, the high-performing reps doing three times as much, you could pay 15, you're paying seven. So here's what I want to get people um, to start thinking about, especially if you're in RevOps or sales ops, or if you are at a company where your incentive plan is very linear. We need to start adding accelerators. And we have two ways to add accelerators. One is to say, well, we're going to pay you $333 per meeting for the first six meetings. And then once you're a quota, we're going to pay you $500 a meeting. Okay. How would that have helped in the previous scenario? You had your first SDR getting three meetings. He's still getting $1,000. Your SDR that's killing it, getting those nine meetings, instead of, of $3,000, nine times 333 would be $3,000. They're now getting $2,000 for the first six, six meetings. 
and $500 per meeting thereafter. So they get to 3,500. We go back to the drawing board. We look at our two reps. One is at three meetings, still getting 5K a month. The other one is at nine meetings and they're not 7,500. It's better, but I think we gotta stretch it even more. So I'm gonna start giving you some ideas on how like world-class companies would compensate their reps. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two types of accelerators. I'm actually gonna decelerate or eliminate commissions for the first part of your quota. And I'm gonna much higher incentivize your uh, last part of your, of your productivity slash quota. So imagine if I still wanna have those SDRs hired at 50K base and $2,000 per month commission, so 74K OT. The way I would structure it is for the first two meetings, you get $0 because you really have to do minimum effort to get two meetings for the month. And then imagine I pay you $500 per meeting for the next four. When you get to six meetings, we're at the same spot as we were before. Zero dollars for the first two, $500 for the next four, you're at 2,000. It is the same base and the same OTE as a guy who's getting $333 per meeting. What changes is how your bottom performers get their commission. Because now the guy that was getting three meetings a month, that person's no longer getting $1,000. They're only at 500. And if you had another rep that was at two meetings per month, he's now getting zero. So what this plan incentivizes by eliminating the commission for the first part of the quota, you're creating very big levers. You're forcing people who are really not doing well to either quit or hustle. And that gives you um, the ability to really uh, keep your top performers and start weeding out bottom performers. I'm going to stop here for a second and read some of the comments, questions, Q&A. Let's see what we have. Having an SDR type role, flat commission based on four criteria. So uncapped plans. Yes, somebody said they have a capped plan and if that is common. Uh, let me tell you this, if you have a capped plan, that is a really bad idea because it's disincentivizing to go above and beyond, right? If you are in an SDR role and they cap you at like, imagine I cap you at eight meetings, what would you do? You would do what I would do too. Like I would, especially now that we work remote, come on guys, I would work until I get exactly eight meetings and then I would sandbag. I would send all my meetings to the next month and the next month and the next month. And that's a really bad idea for the business because right now business is one as many meetings as possible as quickly as possible. So if you cap commissions, that's a terrible idea. Um, yes, and then somebody asked, asked, hey, how does it work for leadership? How is my SDR manager or my, or my uh, SDR director getting compensated? The most likely way that they're getting compensated is gonna be on the full team performance and they're gonna have a little bit of quota relief. And it's not even on this full, full team performance, it's on the projected headcount. So your SDR manager, they'll tell him, hey manager, you need to be managing six SDRs at any given point. And they, their combined quota is 30 meetings a month or whatever it might be, right? Your, your manager is gonna be probably comped on getting those 30 meetings a month. Now, if they have less SDRs, they get, they get hurt. So they do need to really hire quickly. Um, and if they have like one that's doing incredibly well, that kind of compensates for the other ones that are, aren't doing as well. So yes, they're going to end up getting an average uh, or like their comp's going to end up in about like where the team is averaging. So that usually incentivizes them to really help everybody and anybody to increase their meetings. Cool. Now I want to run you through like, um, further creating incentives for top performers. Would I keep the, the idea of the nine meetings held versus the three meetings held uh, in the comp plan? The comp plan that I create is it, it minimizes incentives for the first 33% of quota. So in this case, we're looking at six meetings. The first two meetings pay zero. The next few meetings are gonna pay, let's say the $500 that we we're paying before. But what I usually do is beyond the quota, I increase the, the, the uh, commissions per meeting even further. So let me run this scenario in this case. I'm paying $0 for zero to two meetings, $500 from two to six, and $800 thereafter. 
when you analyze a person that is getting nine meetings now, they get $0 for the first two, $2,000 from two to six. And on six to nine, they're getting $800 per meeting. So they make another $2,400. So now what ends up happening is the person who was at, uh, at those nine meetings is making $4,400 in commission versus the rep that was at three meetings is only getting $500 in commission. The commission between somebody who's getting nine meetings versus three meetings is nine times more. That is a good incentive plan because it's really now pushing your people to, to do higher. Now, are they making nine times more money? No, it's the commission portion. So when you start looking at like their full comp, the poor performing rep still has their 50K base and now they're making $500 in commissions. So they're at 56K for the year. Not great. The guy who was doing really well getting nine meetings a month, they're getting a 5K base. They're now making $4,400 in commission per month. That's $9,400 a month. Holy cow. Like we're looking at over $100,000. Cool. I feel like a few people are going to uh, have some questions here. So somebody says, Tito, in your example, yeah, correct. After six meetings, eight hundred dollars. I just ran through that scenario. Question scenarios keeping coming. Cool. Cool. Um, somebody asked uh, for their first sales rep, and that's what I'm going to transition a little bit here too, because we're talking about SDRs. I want to talk a little bit about sales reps, and then we can talk about a little bit more scenarios. I want to hear from people. I'm going to start up on a big company. My average deal size is low, is high. This is how I'm getting incentivized. Can you give me advice? How would you run it? Is this fair? Things like that. Feel free to share. And I'm realizing that, of course, that when the meetings come through, we can see their names. Uh, it'd be cool to, to do this in any anonymous way. I don't know if that's going to be possible. But having said that, let, let me run you through AE comp structures. The most common way to pay AEs is the same idea as the SDRs. They just pay a flat percentage for every deal closed, call it a 10%. And that's super, super common. And then the same incentives that we're talking about, the mediocre people have an incentive to stay uh, because they're just getting their base. And even if they close 30% of their quota, they're at least getting money, so all that. So how do, we, how do we change this completely? What I'm gonna do here for this example is I do, I would say that this is very, very different if you're in a very early stage company versus in a very late stage company when it comes to the AEs. Because in the early stages, you really need to collect revenue. Like you getting money in the door really, really matters. So I, I'm going to pull the same levers. The beginning of my comp plan, I'm going to tank it. And the end of my comp plan, I'm going to really raise it. And there's a very simple way to do this when you're an A. If I, had, if I was a startup CEO and I was paying my first sales rep on their sales, I would say the following. I'm going to pay you zero commission for the first $200,000 worth of revenue you get to sell this year. Anything over $200,000, I'm going to pay you 25% commission. It's very high. Why am I doing that? And I would actually run a very, very simple structure for the first one, two, three, four sales reps. Because in the early days, your sales rep is also your account manager. He's also running onboarding. He's running customer success. He's like chasing clients for invoices. Like you really don't have a lot of people. You don't have a lot of structure. So I want to pull the lever down because if that sales rep is costing you as a startup $200,000 between taxes, benefits, insurance, tools, management, all that stuff, I really can't start paying you money on the first deal that you sign. And by eliminating the cost in the front end of your revenue collected, it allows me to push it further up. So I can go all the way up to 25%. So what does that look like? You join as an AE, call it your base is 100K. First year you work, you have two AEs, one sells $300,000, one sells $600,000. Cool, the guy who sold $300,000 got paid zero for the first 200K, got paid 25% of the next 100K, got 25K. Their final comp, 100K base, 25K commission. On the other sales rep who sold $600,000, look at the math. They get zero for the first $200,000, 25% on the next $400,000. Boom, that's another $100,000. So the first sales rep 
sold 300K, he got 125. Second sales rep sold 600K, he got 200K. So it is much more aligned. And the further you go, this creates an, an, a natural accelerator because it's zero and then it goes really, really high. Um, the other nuance in early stage startups is I would pay the commission on the total contract value and I would pay the commission on uh, money collected, not on the deal signed. There's a couple of reasons for that. First, you want to pay on the total contract value because you really want to incentivize multi-year contracts. You really want to incentivize a few other things that like like as much revenue as possible, right? It's also true that the AE is going to be like managing the account and trying to upsell and do all that stuff. And right now you don't have account management. You don't have a lot of things. Like it's a very lean, mean machine. And what you really got to do is not incentivize to just like close deals that we know are going to fail. So like, oh, it's going to be a one year great contract. And then like this client, we know it's going to fail. We're just going to sell him. I don't want to do that. So that's why I'm paying the high commissions on the full contract. That is, that incentivizes also to the sales rep to not think like, I can't start with a small trial. I can't make the client successful in a, in a short period because then I'm not going to get my commissions. The usual sales reps only get paid on the first year. But you should not do that in the early days. In the early days, do it on the total contract value. So that if the sales rep feels like this is a great fit and we can really help the client, I just want to close the deal, help them out as much as possible, and then work on my upsell and then make a lot of money on that upsell. Cool. I'm going to take another quick break and I'm going to read some of the comments. Uh, what about setting two metrics with balance weights for each? 50% on mini sell, 50% on open ops. Again, I'm not going to like the open ops on the SDR side. And the reason I don't like the open ops on the SDR side is the AE really determines if the op gets open or not. And like the AE, if you don't, if you're early stage and you don't have exact enter and exit criteria for every stage, I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen that create really strange and annoying power dynamics. Like if the SDR really sucks up to the AE, the AE will say like, Okay, dude, I don't care. I'll just qualify every meeting so you can get paid. And then, um, you know, uh, and then if it's closed lost, I'll wait a few days and I'll mark it closed lost. So now all of a sudden the AE has a lot of incentive over what the SDR is doing. And if the AE gets annoyed with the SDR, it can just say, oh yeah, disqualified, disqualified, disqualified. We've also seen that even if it's not a relationship problem between the SDR and the AE or it incentivizes to, for SDRs to suck up to the AEs, We've all worked at companies where like different AEs qualify at different rates, regardless of where the meeting comes from. So I hate that the AE would have power in their hands to go on CRM and move something a stage and get somebody else paid. It shouldn't be in your power. We should all be aligned on trying to maximize revenue. So that's why I really don't like comping SDRs on pipeline stages. The only the only like place where I would like even consider it is all your enter and exit criteria have been agreed upon. You have a sales operations and a sales enablement team that is looking at your AEs and where the meetings are dying. You're running like monthly reports on stage one to stage two conversion, stage two to stage three conversion, stage three to stage four conversion. And they have a team that whenever those, those conversions are looking weird across your AEs, flags get raised and questions get asked. But like, literally, I've worked with 50 companies. I could tell you maybe IBM is the only one that could like create those weird complex incentives. Outside of them, if you're a startup and you have less than like 10, 15, 20 AEs and less than like 10 SDRs, I would definitely not put anything on like uh, kind of like meetings moving to pipeline. You're giving your AEs too much power and you're creating weird power dynamics. Um. How do you measure if meetings are held with well-qualified leads? A very good question. For us, and I think every company should do this, there should be a survey being sent to the AEs immediately after every meeting. And I ask him just one simple question. Can you rate how good this meeting was and what are the next steps? And there's four options for that. One is the meeting was disqualified. It was a complete waste of time. One step up is this is a qualified meeting and qualified account. However, there's no next steps. One step up is this is a qualified meeting and a qualified account, right? But there's no immediate next steps. Next steps are going to come in the future. I'm going to stay in touch as an AE. And then the final option is 
great meeting, good account, good contact. Next steps are immediate. I'm moving it in pipeline. The reason I want to know that is for two things. I want to see the differences across my AEs and across my SDRs and who's scoring how much on their meetings and how are these working. But it also allows me to immediately get feedback on the meetings rather than have it for me to wait until the AE either moves to pipeline or close lost a meeting. And it allows me to distinguish between the disqualified meetings, bad account versus good meeting, but no next steps. Because in a regular CRM, both are going to close lost and there's no distinction. So by having a survey and having every AE take a survey, then I can go and look at like, let me compare my AEs, John versus Jenny versus Jackie versus somebody else. What percentage of meetings are they disqualifying? Is it the same across all the reps or is it very different? And then when I look at how many meetings the SDRs have booked for the different, different AEs, I can also look at the same data. The meetings coming from John versus Jack versus Thomas versus Tito. Are all the SDRs getting a very similar rating or is Tito or Tom or Jack getting like a ton of disqualified accounts? If they are, then you can isolate the problem and go look at your SDR and say, hey, dude, compared to the team on the surveys, everybody's saying that your accounts are disqualifying at a much higher rate. We need to fix that. We need to change that. And then you can work with your SDR, depending a little bit on your emotions, on how to select the target accounts, how to qualify, and how to make sure they show up. So good question. Uh, correct. And Eva is 100% right. The business should definitely provide a uh, company like the, the SDRs and the AEs uh, accounts, uh, definitely accounts that are good fits and criteria for how to find more accounts that are good fits. And the same thing with personas, like director level and above, blah, 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 in these areas of the business, these are good, right? You get a meeting with a janitor, disqualified. And we want the account executives to disqualify that and reject it uh, and so on and so forth. Cool. Uh, last question I'm gonna read before I continue a little bit here on uh, a little bit more advanced AE stuff. Uh, is there a bonus paid to the SDRs if the post-meeting AE survey has a minimum threshold of qualified meeting plus qualified account plus next steps? Correct. So the only thing you do um, as you advance here a little, bit, uh, a little bit further is you pay your SDRs on any meeting that is not disqualified. If the meeting is marked disqualified because it's the wrong account and the wrong persona, you do not pay the SDR. Now, why do I like this? Even though I don't like the incentive of it being stage one or stage two or stage three, didn't I say that I don't want the AEs to have power over the SDR? That's correct. This is purely on the target account and the buyer persona. So this is verifiable information. Every time somebody marks my meeting at D and I'm a SDR, I say, wait a second. You told me that I need to reach out to companies that have between 100 and 700 employees and that I need to reach out to the marketing department in these several roles. This guy is a director of marketing at this company that has 117 employees. Why is this a D? Cool. Or why is this a disqualified account? Right? And we can move it to a qualified account in the survey and we can still pay the SDR. It's not about the feeling of the AE. It's not the, the AE saying, oh yeah, this is good. And then what this allows you to do, this quick survey, it also allows you to check for your AEs. Out of the accounts that you received, out of the meetings that you received, Mr. AE, that are qualified, how many did you actually move to stage one? How many did you actually move to stage two? How many did you actually move to stage three? And now I can start training my team where are you starting to see drop off? Most companies don't have enter and exit criteria for their sales stages. Most companies don't have surveys. Most companies are not collecting feedback. And what that means is you're paying SDRs and AEs on like random things like stage movements. The AE controls the movement. There's power dynamics. You can break a lot of things. So let's recap. Let's go back and recap for a second. SDRs get paid mostly on meetings held. If we're mid-market enterprise, only on meetings held. If you're SMB, I'm fine if you had some revenue incentive. Meetings held and meetings held, uh, mostly on meetings held. The meeting held has just one qualification criteria. It must be the right account and the right persona. And the way we're going to know that is by an AE survey. Cool. 
the incentive plan of the SDRs is going to be for the first 30% of their quota, they get $0. So if you're at, call it six meetings, for the first two, you get $0. For two to six, you get an average amount, in this case, $500. From six upwards, you can pay $800. It creates very exponential accelerators. When you go to the AE side of things, things change a little bit. If you're very early stage for companies, what you're going to do is you're going to pay $0 to the first 200K worth of total contract value sold. And they're going to pay a 25% on total contract value. It's not on the first year. It's on any revenue collected. And that's because you don't have account management. You don't have CSMs. You don't have any of that. As the company evolves, we're going to be changing that a little bit. Once you have four plus AE team, you probably now have account management. You have a CSM. You have a few other people where the AE doesn't need to collect payments, doesn't need to onboard the account, doesn't need to make sure they're successful. They're mostly going to be maybe on net new sales and maybe some upsells, right? And as you get bigger, 6, 8, 10, 12 AEs, you might now have an account manager that is even responsible for upsells. But at the smaller case of the 4 to 10 AEs, I'm probably going to pay 8 to 12% of annual contract value, ACV. I'm not going to have a $200,000 uh, ramp or uh, amount of money that you're not getting paid for because now we have like four AEs. We, we, we have a team, we figured it out. So you can just pay eight to 12% for, for the regular commission. And when you hit quota, you can accelerate it. That's going to be more common. Are one sales rep? Zero for the first 200K, 25% of total contract value. The other thing that changes uh, that is better when you have a bigger team is you pay on contract signature you do not pay on revenue collected. In the early stages, I do like um, paying uh, AEs on revenue collected because they are really driving the full process. Cool, that was a good summary. Um, I see two have come for Q&A. Initial pipeline as a KPI. Um, for SDRs, I don't love it. Again, too much control on the AE. Uh, that's even worse than saying just stage one or stage two or stage three, because if you can do initial pipeline, the AE can also like put a random number on the um, on the revenue. Like, oh yeah, this is like a hundred thousand dollar deal. And, like, even if that's a good one, it might end up closing for fifty, right? So, yeah, you get kind of hurt by uh, by putting on like pipeline. Um, 2% if less than 50%, 4% for 50 to 100%, 5% over 100. Oh, that's cool. So somebody said that they're getting incentivized on a percentage of revenue based on quota. Is this an AE? I don't, I don't necessarily know. Um, it's hard to answer that one. Cool. Um, Cool, we've, we've run the webinar almost fully. We've talked about SDR incentives, we've talked about AE incentives, we've summarized it. I wanna open up for questions. What other questions do people have? I'd be curious for people, if you wanna chime in on how similar or different is the comp plan that you have laid out for yourself or for your teams versus what I'm talking here. And um, for those who are like, I don't know, uh, also like for, for companies that have like really cool comp plans, uh, if you are recruiting people, as Savannah said at the beginning, if you're posting on the channel, things like that, that'd be really, really cool. What kind of spiffs do you recommend having? Really good question. I love that. I am actually very much against spiffs. And I'm going to explain to you the one big spiff I give and why I run it this way. There's a book called Payoff by Dan Ariely. It's a super quick read. I think it's like 40 pages. It's kind of foolish that he made it into a book. It should have been like an article, but fine. Go buy the book. What the book tells you is that if you start doing spiffs, you train people incorrectly. There's this very famous story, I think it was in India, about cobras. So the government was very concerned about the um, uh, too many cobras being out there in the wild. So then they created an incentive plan where they said, anybody who kills a cobra we're going to give him an incentive. We're going to give him $100. At in the beginning, it seemed to be working. Like cobras were getting killed and the cobra population was lowering until a few people figured out a way around it, which is, wait a second, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start breeding the cobras. I'm going to create a cobra farm 
Let's get hundreds of cobras, and then we're going to start killing them, and we get $100 per cobra we kill. So we just need to freaking incentivize for them to be born, and then we can kill more. And what ended up happening is the, the government figured that out at one point, eliminated the incentive for the cobras, and then the population was like, oh, fuck, okay, so this cobra farm is no longer a business. I'm just going to let the cobras in the wild. So from the beginning to the end of this program, there were more wild cobras out there in the wild, and they had also paid people to kill cobras. So it's a really, really bad idea. Why do I not like spiffs? Today, whoever gets to 100 dials is going to get $50. Cool. So everybody makes a lot of dials. What happens the day later, three days later, five days later? There's no spiff. If I'm an SDR, I'd be like, guys, guys, hey, hey let's make very few dials so that they give us more spiffs. It's really dumb. The business and the employees aren't aligned because you're creating random rewards. Now, what do I think is a really awesome, and, and this is why I don't like spiff. To me, spiff is something that is thrown out temporarily and taken back. Another thing thrown out temporarily and take it back. Thrown out temporarily and take it back. What I like doing is the incentive should be clear. So at AltiSales, something we do is we do three times a year, we meet up as a company. And what that means is that we're going to look at uh, one, one, one of those three times is a company-wide invitation. Everybody's invited. We fly you in. We have fun. The other two are only for quota-carrying reps. It's Think of it as like a president's club. And we say whoever has hit quota for the six-month period is invited to president's club. That's a great freaking spiff. It gets people excited. It gets people to go above and beyond. And it's a non-monetary incentive that gets people to like work a little bit harder. It eliminates anything sandbagging. The incentive is always there. So nobody is like, they're not paying me to make calls today. So I'm not gonna not gonna make calls. Like any meeting, any time during a six-month period counts. I don't like spiffs that are super short term. If you do this, whoever gets X this week. Then the next weeks, they don't want to work hard, and they only want to work hard in the weeks that you get spiffs. Well, if this is a consistent, anytime, it's six-month batches. As soon as one ends, the next one starts. The previous one ends, the next one starts. But it's an event-based driven. I really, really, really like that. Um, Sanjay just asked, what's the industry benchmark on the total cost percentage-wise of every dollar of net new ACV? Yes, you can look at uh, some... Uh, industry data, the cost of revenue for every dollar of ACV is a dollar and 33 cents. Yes, you heard me right. You are companies are spending more money to acquire one dollar of ACV than the dollar that they acquire. Why? Well, because of retention. Your average retention should be three years. So now your cost of revenue was a dollar 33. You retain the same ACV for three years, you get three dollars. The other thing to note is that the average cost of ACV is including all costs of marketing and all costs of sales. This is the cost of revenue. So that means this includes the cost per lead on Facebook ads and Google ads and this ads and those ads. It includes the salaries, taxes, benefits of insurance of all the marketing people, sales operations, sales, sales development, sales leadership. All those costs are being taken into account. So that gives you a really, really good idea. The business is still profitable due to the retention of, of the uh, customers. And the longer you retain, uh, obviously, the more money you make. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, sales teams with weekly spiff contests and people would just stand back for a spiff day. 100%, dude. Your company's dumb if they're doing that, especially when people work remote. Like when you're in the office, at least I can see if you're working. If you're remote, like I'm at a WeWork. I have no idea what my employees are doing right now. I hope they're working, but they might not be. And if I only give them spiffs on Tuesdays to make phone calls, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> calls on Tuesday. Woo! Everybody, every other day, like nobody's doing anything. I also think that in a company where like a lot of employees are working remote, the incentives that I'm talking about today are so much more important. So much more important. Don't pay people for the first 30% of quota. People are like working three hours a day and making a ton of money. Or they work three hours a day. They're just, they're happy with their base. And then they get a few meetings and they get a commission. 
I think that we're going to come to a point where people who work remote are going to be offered lower base salaries and higher commissions. Now, it's interesting. How low can your base salary go? Well, I don't want you to be at a base salary where like, you're concerned that you can't pay rent, that you can't sustain yourself, right? Like, I want you to have the minimum viable base salary so that you have enough to feed yourself. And then if you want to make a ton of money, go make a ton of money. I'm like, that's how we build compliance here at AltiSales. Like, the reps who are at 150% of quota versus the reps that are at 50% of quota are making like nine times more commission. That's how you win. Sales managers should not carry an individual quota. I do not like that. As a sales manager, if I have a personal quota, I'm not incentivized to help my team win as much as I'm incentivized to make myself win, right? I want to hit to my quota and then I, I want to kind of like help my colleagues. Not a good plan. I want the AE manager to be paid on the quota of the full team. So they maximize the amount of time that they spend helping others succeed. Otherwise, there's no manager. Nobody's helping them out. Nobody's enabling. Nobody's coaching. Nobody's training. Nobody's doing anything. Uh, if an AE leaves, is it okay to have the sales manager carry their quota until the new hire gets ramped up? Uh, I wouldn't say carry their quota, but like if there were like meetings that were like or sales cycles, deals that were halfway through. Um, I hope you have chorus or gong or something like that, because what I would do is I'd have the sales manager uh, or other colleagues of them look at the call recordings, inspect CRM to see all the communication and just reach out and say, hey, Jenny, you know, Savannah or your previous AE has uh, recently like moved roles uh, and is no longer managing sales here at blah, blah, blah. I'm taking over. Uh, I've been briefed on blah, 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 blah. would love to have a chat and then they just take it from there. So yes, you need to pass those over. Um, how do you know if you're being compensated correctly? Uh, Ross, send me a message on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll help you out. Um, it really depends on geographical locations. If you're an SDR in the US, 50 to 55K base is what I'm seeing. 75K OTE on average is what I'm seeing. Uh, here at Altisales, we pay a little bit more. We pay 55K base. 69k OTE, uh, 55k base, 79k OTE. It's 24k. You make two thousand dollars a month. Our top performers, for example, though, I just sent a sixty-three hundred dollar check to somebody. So if that is the case, they're getting forty-eight a month plus sixty-three. Like that guy's gonna end up at about one hundred and twenty-five or something like that. Um, and then on the AE side, it really varies because different products sell at different rates and whatever else. So um, if you wanna, if you wanna chat more about your comp, I'm happy to help. New to using SDRs, was there a specific number of meetings booked for the quarter? They have an inconsistent hitting their target over the last 12 months, quarter to quarter. Should I make the target more gradual, like weekly or monthly? Uh, for SDRs, I like, I, like, um, uh, I like the goals being monthly, not quarterly. Quarterly is like too long, especially if you're going to pay them on it. When I'm an SDR, I want to get paid as soon as possible for the meeting being held. I don't want to get a meeting held in... July 15th, that is for my Q3 quota, and I get paid on September 15th. Like, as an SDR, my base salary is low. I want money fast, so make it monthly quotas. Weekly is too soon, but a monthly feels about right because that's my monthly pay schedule. If it's a weekly quota, you're not going to pay me faster than monthly or bi-weekly, so monthly is the way that I go. Um, Sarah, yes, we're going to have the recording for sure uh, within 24 hours. Cool. People, I think we're running out of time. I'm happy to stick around, answer any other questions. Um, if not, find me on LinkedIn, uh, at Tito Bort. And uh, feel free to uh, send anything there. Oh, it seems like there are two more on the Q&A. Uh, two, two, two. What accelerators are typical in the mid-stage pre-IPO company? Uh, somebody's asking that. Is that for SDRs or for AEs? I'll stick around and keep answering questions. AEs. OK, great. Um, what you're usually going to see uh, when you're like mid-stage, like pre-IPO, um, is, is going to be just less crazy things uh, on like, you're not going to be paid on TCV. You're probably going to get paid on the annual contract value. Um, depending on the incentives of the, of the business, like sometimes when they're pre-IPO, they really want to show like incoming cash flow being high. So they might pay you 
a little bit more incentive to collect money up front or for like multi-year deals or things like that. Um, but usually it's a very simple, you know, base plus, you know, depending on the type of product and how hot your market is, like I want to say eight to 12% commission on every deal uh, based on ACV. And then when you hit accelerator, when you hit your quota and you go beyond, I've seen it somewhere between like 14 and 18%. Though, again, if you're an earlier stage company, I've seen those commissions percentage wise go a little bit higher, 10, 12, 14% for, for um, the initial. And then uh, like on the accelerator, 18, 20, 22, sometimes like they can go pretty high. But uh, pre-IPO sounds like a, there's a dozen plus AEs and a dozen plus SDRs, if not five dozen. So uh, cool. Hopefully that uh, that helps.